Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All over this place, why don't we just begin to find a place to pray in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, why don't we just get rid of every distraction, get rid of everything that would try to hinder from us receiving what God wants us to receive in here tonight in this place. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come with the Lord, the spirit of unity today. We come with the spirit of love today. In the name of Jesus Christ, oh Lord, we enter into your presence right now. Why don't we just let the joy of the Holy Ghost begin to come over us right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, I know we intercede and I know we weep for the souls, but I feel it is imperative that we receive the joy of the Lord because that is our strength. That is what keeps us going. Why don't we just begin to let the joy of the Holy Ghost begin to flood this place in the name of Jesus. Why don't we just let it fill the house right now? Hallelujah, God. That's it. Why don't we just begin to let the joy of the Lord begin to flow right now? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Romo si anda raba kaya raba se. Come on, that's it. We can't do the work of the Lord without the joy of the Holy Ghost. Come on, we need the joy in the house right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Why don't we just begin to worship Him right now and lift up our voice to Him? Why don't we just begin to thank Him right now? Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, when the world sees the joy in your face, that smile on your face, they're going to begin to wonder what you have. They're going to begin to wonder what this is really all about. Come on, that scene. Let the joy of the Lord begin to be your strength tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yay, Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's continue in that vein right now. Romo Kaye. Romo Kaye Ramahati Lamaha. Romo Kaye Ramashandaya. Romo Kaye Remeshiandaha. Come on, that's it. Somebody flow into that vein right now. Somebody flow in the spirit right now. Romo Yanaye Remesi. Romo Yanamanda Rebesi. Ikaraba Sataye. Come on, it is the will of God that you have joy in your spirit. It is the will of God right now in the name of Jesus Christ that your cup runneth over. It is the will of God that you experience the joy of the Holy Ghost. That you have exceeding great joy. Come on, it is the will of God that we have great joy tonight. It is the will of God that we have great joy in His presence. In His presence, there is joy. There is fullness of joy. There is no room for bitterness or anger because it is fullness of joy. There is no room for any sorrow. It's fullness of joy. Having no room for anything else but it, but joy. Romo ya taramando robo 
Alamando robo si andar de besi andar de beti robo ki andar de besi. Come on, I don't know what you've gone through this past month and this past week, but it is the will of God that you can experience joy wherever you are. Come on, when the disciples were persecuted, when the apostles were persecuted, they counted it joy that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ's sake. Come on, maybe what you are going through is for you to die to your flesh and you are suffering for Christ's sake. And that is more than enough to experience joy of the Holy Ghost. Somebody catch that right now in the house. Somebody catch that spirit right now. Come on, that's it. Count it worthy. Count it worthy for Christ. Come on, there was a spirit of revelation that wanted to just sit in this place. The disciples experienced joy when they suffered for Christ's sake. Maybe what you're doing it is considered suffering, but it's getting you to die to your flesh. And that is enough to have joy over. That is enough to experience great joy, exceeding in a Abundant joy. Come on, I feel that in the house right now. Romo Yandaya Ramahasataya. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I believe in great peace and I believe also in great joy. Come on. It's a progression. If you're going to experience the peace of God, it will take you to the joy of the Holy Ghost. Come on, there is an atmosphere of joy in this place because where the presence of the Lord is, the Bible says there is fullness of joy. Come on, where God's presence is, there should always be joy. Romo ikaya rabahasata. Romo Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yela marakataya rabosata. Robo sianda rabaha kianda rebesi. Iola rabaha se kianda rabosata. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Handa rabosha. Ah, he karama sanda. Ilo robo. Somebody just begin to let that river of the Holy Ghost flow right now. Maybe you just walked into this place. Would you just begin to plug into the atmosphere of prayer right now? Come on, the Bible says when the disciples prayed, the place was shaken. Let's just let the apostolic authority begin to flow right now. Come on, let's just begin to plug in and be apostolic right now. Father, I let go of every single doubt, every single care, every single expectation that is not of you, O oh God. And I allow you to begin to flow right now in the name of Jesus. I allow your spirit right now to begin to move, O oh Lord, through me, O oh God. Come on, let's plug into that vein as a body right now. Let's plug into that vein of the Holy Ghost right now together. 
Ramondo robo corianda ere besi. Come on, prayer is not always about what you feel. Hia karebe. There may not be a feeling of emotion, but the Spirit of God is working right now, regardless of if there's a feeling or not. Romo ye kanda rabashe. He karaba kaye. Come on, there's always a flow of the Holy Ghost. There's always a flow of the Holy Ghost. It's not because there is no flow. It's because we just haven't tapped into it fully. Come on, let's devote ourselves in prayer right now to find that flow. Romo ikia la mahaya ramashaya. Ia namando robo sianda ramahaya. Ye rabaha shata rabo korabaha shata ye robo shianda ramaha tie la manda rabaka halamorianda la boroko shianda rabaha ye ikaha rabo she erebe shianda erebe shi Come on, some of you can feel it right now in the name of Jesus. Romo Come on, that's it. Let's just get our minds focused right now. Come on, in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Romo ye nahasi kande rebesi. Andalabori andalabo kori andaya. Come on, God is leading you right now to begin to tap into that apostolic authority that's already in this place. Come on, in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, God wants this to happen right now. That's it, just focus right now like you are already doing. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. That's it. Begin to go a little bit deeper in the spirit right now. Begin to plug in a little bit deeper. Come on, that's it. Step in to that spirit of intercession that you feel in this place. Come on, God is drawing us closer to Him. God wants to fellowship with us. Come on, we want to fellowship with God, but let us not forget He wants to fellowship with us more than we want to fellowship with Him. Come on, He's inviting us into His midst right now. Come on, God is saying, I have already invited you. Now it is just your choice to step in. Robo Iandarabasa. Robo, come on, I can feel us accepting the invitation of the king right now. That's it. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. God is doing a work right now. Come on, God is saying, there is a table that I have prepared for you in my presence, and it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Come on, that's it. Let's step into that vein. Come on, I'm not satisfied with anything less than apostolic. Robo yandaramasandaya. Would you just begin to lift up your hands right now and lift up your voice? Karamanda Ramando Robo Siandaya Ramando Robo Sianda Ramaka Romondo Rianda Ramashandaya. Come on, I refuse to accept anything less than apostolic. There is a hunger in this place. There is a desire in this place. Let the people of God begin to cry out unto their God. Robo He is not just the God of Isaac and Abraham and Jacob. He is my God now. Romondo Oh, 
Come on, let that hunger begin to stir. Let that thirst for the living water begin to stir. Let that desire to be in God's presence begin to stir. Sometimes you got to stir the gift. He candara mashe rebesia anda rebesi anda rabata he karamando robosi kaye ina sanda rabata come on there is a deep call a deep call in this place ilorobo sanda rebesi anda ye why don't you just begin to go a little bit deeper we're already deep in the spirit but just get lost in the presence of God God wants you to get into his presence to the point where you're so deep you're lost in it. Come on, let's get lost in the presence of God. Come on, our humanity knows how to do things without God. Our humanity knows how to make it by in a service. But can we just let the Spirit of God begin to stir something in us that causes us to lose our control and let the Holy Ghost begin to flow and let the Holy Ghost begin to speak. Come on, there's some of you, you haven't got lost in his presence in a while, but God is inviting you back into that place of spiritual deepness when you begin to pray. Come on. I don't want to stop praying when the clock stops, Lord, or when my flesh says I'm done. I want to keep on pressing, oh Lord, into your presence. I want to be like the woman of the issue of blood that said, if I just press my way and and touch the master. I'm going to receive what I need. I'm going to receive what I've been seeking. Hakanda. Come on, that's it. Come on, that's it. Hatalabarianda la bakahaya la bahasata. Iloborondo la borianda rabantaye. Oh, if I can just be in his presence a little bit longer, then my flesh is comfortable. Something would begin to happen. Something inside of me would begin to change. Shatarabha se rebesia and rebeki and rebo sandaya and rebo kori and rabba se rebesi he karabha se te rebesi and daya oh Jesus oh Jesus alabo kora mahasete can I speak something to you in the Holy Ghost just for a moment. What the Holy Ghost is about to say, I mean this with the utmost respect. I'm not saying this with an ulterior motive, but I just feel the Lord wanted to speak this. Just begin to keep on praying. Just begin to focus your spirit on God. The Lord began to speak to me as we, we just began praying, and He said, you want to know why sometimes you go to service and you never leave changed? And I said, why? He said, you never push past the comfort zone and your flesh has not been wrestled. It's not been rocked. It's not been pushed out of the way. And so many times we go into services and we're comfortable. We're comfortable. I'm not against these pews, but I thank God for them. But sometimes we can get so comfortable in an atmosphere we're so used to that when a move of God that we've never experienced before shows up, we almost don't know what to do because we've remained comfortable and used to a place. 
But I feel in the Holy Ghost, God is saying, if you would just step out of the comfort zone. And there's some of you in this place, you've desired a place in God. And God is saying right now, that is only going to happen if you push past the flesh. If you want true growth, if you want a true relationship with God, not just in this service, but there are going to be days when you go home and when you think you've prayed enough, if you want true growth, if you want true intimacy with me, you're going to have put past the flesh and go into the spirit you're going to have to go a little bit further like I did in the garden would you do that right now as the Holy Ghost is leading you would you go a little bit further than your flesh is comfortable would you get lost in the presence of God come on can we get to a place where we stop caring about what others think and just get lost in worship come on that's it that's it the authority that is in this place is the authority that tears down strongholds would you lift up your voice right now all over this place in worship in worship it takes just get radical in your worship right now be apostolic in your worship there is a flow right now there is a flow of the spirit Come on, God's wondering what your worship will look like in this moment. Let a Holy Ghost boldness come upon you right now to begin to worship God in spirit and in truth. I will dance like David did when the Spirit of the Lord moves upon my heart. I will dance like David danced. Come on, God inhabits the praises. God inhabits the praises. Oh, Rianda Lama Rianda, would you lift up your voice one more time unto God? Would you begin to worship God with your voice right now? Come on, death and life are in the power of your tongue. Let's begin to use that right now. Let's use that power and authority from God. Hallelujah. Ramanda Raboshataya. Come on, let's just let that flow. Let's just let that flow. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you just begin to close your eyes right now in this moment? Jesus. God is going to begin to speak to you things right now as you are closing your eyes, as you are focusing on Him, of things He is going to do tonight. The Lord spoke to me through a man of God one one service, and He said, You are now going to become the man that you see in the visions and dreams that God gives you. And I can feel the Holy Ghost saying, you are now going to become the person that God has so promised you are going to be. This day, I feel that so strongly in the Holy Ghost right now. 
God is saying, this day you are a new creature. The person that you see in the eyes of God is the person you are now in the name of Jesus Christ. If that bears witness with your spirit, would you just begin to lift up your voice and begin to lift up your hands in the name of Jesus Christ. I am new in the name of Jesus. I am new in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on. Come on, what are you going to take home with you tonight? Uh, What are you going to take home with you tonight? The presence of the Lord is in this place. And he is ready to do what he has promised to do. Let's keep that same atmosphere of worship towards him, Lord. Father, I worship you, Jesus, for making me new, Lord.
can happen, a miracle can happen in this place. A miracle can happen, a miracle can happen, a miracle can happen in this place. A miracle can happen, a miracle can happen, a miracle can happen in this place.
do in word. What you speak. In deed, your actions. Do it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Giving thanks to the Father by Him. Would you give thanks to the Lord this evening? Would you just worship Him? Would you shout the name? We sense your presence in this house, Father. We sense a manifestation of your glory here, Lord. We thank you for meeting us here, God. We thank you for this treasure, Lord, in this earthen vessel, this body of clay. He came. In the name of Jesus, somebody shout his name. Somebody shout the wonderful name that has been revealed unto the people of God. The name of the Father is Jesus. The name of the Son is Jesus. Oh, he said, I'll send the Holy Ghost, the Comforter in my name. So the name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. We're baptized in the name. There's forgiveness in the name. Power is in the name. In the name of Jesus. Jesus said, behold, I give you power when the Holy Ghost is come upon you when you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you shall be witnesses unto me. I believe God has moved tonight to anoint you and I that we may become witnesses every single day. Wherever we go, whoever we meet, that we become sensitive to the leading of His Spirit, what to say, what to do. Not out of tradition, not even out of obligation, but out of love. And Jesus said, I'll give you words to speak. I'll anoint your mouth. You don't have to worry what to say in that day. He said, he will anoint your mouth. Would you begin to just receive that promise right now? Would you believe that word right now that God will give you words to speak? It's not going to be your words, but it will be the rhema of God that you simply have to speak as you hear the word of God. In the name of Jesus. Jesus. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's pray for our friends and family prayer list. That God would use that. That God would help us. Invite them to the house of God this coming Sunday. In Jesus' name. How many of you still have your friends and family list? Amen. Would you pray right now for your family and would you contact them today, tomorrow and compel them to be in the house of God? Would you do that right now? Would you pray, Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we pray, Father. We pray right now, soften their hearts. Come on, would you begin to intercede for them? Would you begin to love them? Lord, the backsliders, oh God, those that have left, those that have gotten offended, those that have listened to the voice of the adversary. I pray, God, a softening of their heart. I pray, Lord, a hunger and a thirst to be rekindled in their spirit. They will begin to be reminded, Lord God, of the experiences that they've had with you. Deep moves of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. 
in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Now, would you believe your prayer right now? Come on, would you release your faith? Would you believe your prayer even tonight? God's going to quicken you to what to do, what to say, perhaps an email, perhaps a text message. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Jesus' mission is to seek and to save that which was lost. And if, if each one of us will reach one person, that is the will of God. Each one of us will reach one person. How many can reach one person? How many believe that? Some begin in five, two, one talent, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And there's a scripture in, I believe, in Luke 23. And this is after people were bidden to come to the marriage supper. Typified of this story in Luke 14, 23. And it says, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. And the servant said, it is done. The Lord said to the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges. The highways where people traffic and walk, live, do their business. It could be your workplaces, your school, the grocery store, the bank, the local taco stand, everywhere and the hedges and compel them some say compel them so we're not merely inviting them we're if they would engage us in conversation we will compel them we will convince them if you would amen persuade them that his house may be full would you pray one more time that God will give you a word that will compel your friends will compel your family Heaven and hell is at stake. Their soul is at stake. I release, Lord, an urgency upon us. Your body, your people here, God, in South Orange County. You chose us here, Lord. You planted us here, God. We are here to stay. And we believe it, Lord. We're going to do your will. God, I believe that we're going to saturate South Orange County and North Orange County with the gospel, oh God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let there be in another Sousa Street revival. Let it start here, Lord. Let it start here in Jesus' name. Let it gain roots here, a foothold. In Jesus' name. Somebody rejoice right now and believe your prayer. Somebody rejoice ahead of time. It's called faith. Praise God. Tomorrow will be our connect group. Excuse me, not tomorrow. Friday over at our house. The college and career group will start at 7 p.m. Amen. I want to invite those of you, especially the young people. And I'm so thankful that we were able to go outreach yesterday with Dr. Braden over at Walmart. Amen. Now let me give you the significance of this. We have tried for many, many years. Walmart. Stater Brothers, and it has not opened. And this is, I believe, one of the first. And I know God used Sister Christy. Amen. Would you just pray for this place right now in Jesus' name? That there would be, there is an open door. But I pray, God, as we go out there, that you would draw people unto you. Father, we lift you up. You have been lifted up on the cross. And you said if you be lifted up, you will draw all men unto you. Draw them unto us. 
Draw the hungry. Draw the thirsty, oh God. Draw those, Lord, that you have been dealing with. In the name of Jesus, I bind resistance. I bind the adversary. And I lose liberty in the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Somebody thank him right now. In Jesus' name. And we want to give God praise. There's people that were healed. Amen. There's people that were being prayed for. And bless you, Sister Christy. In Jesus' name. Bringing your co-workers. And little did we know that our Power Sunday car, uh, shirt, the color, kind of blended in with Walmart. And so that was, that was quite amazing. Amen. And this is, I don't know who his name is, Sister Christy. What do you remember? Joey. This is Joey right here. I believe on your left, right? Left. And the one on the right, who is that? The one on the right, who is it? You don't know? Jalal? All right, we'll go with Jalal. Amen. Let's pray for Joey and Jalal. If you would continue praying for him. I know there was two, at least two people that were healed. You want to say, you were there. You want to say a little bit something about, I don't know the details, or are we good? Yes. Well, we had an amazing time. First time the Lord opened that door in Walmart. Amen. And whew, I just felt a new boldness God has given to us. And we didn't stop just handing them the card. Right, Brother Paul? We said, do you have a minute? And then we, those who had a minute, we started a conversation about church, about God. Amen. And then we asked, do you want to be healed? Do you want, to, do you want prayer for healing? And we prayed. Sister Christy brought how many co-workers? Five, seven? You know, <laughs> there was a line, church. There was a line. <laughs> I go, wow. And then um, the first one we prayed for, I forgot her name. Uh, Shanaz, Shanaz. And then so Dylan came and prayed for her. Her left knee had pain. And then I go, so we prayed quick prayer how's your knee and she goes it's gone it, it's gone she's just like it's gone I'm like no how's your knee it's gone I said the pain is gone praise God <laughs> right and then we prayed for a few others um, and then I remember Eden um, she was praying and her mouth was moving she had a mask on she was really getting into it and then she got slain she was like, I had to hold her back. She got slain in the spirit. I go, wow. And then the other one, right, she goes, why am I crying? Why am I crying? So you feel the presence of God. You know, so we're excited. God is doing great things. And we pray, oh, God, that God's going to continue, amen, opening these doors and for the body of Christ, amen, to go where we need to go for the harvest of souls. It is his will in Jesus' name. Right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. We give you glory, God, for that healing. I pray, God, that you would continue to do so, not just in this building, but out in the street. As you did, Lord, you are our pattern in Jesus' name. Tomorrow there will be outreach. And we thank God for Dr. Braden that's here. Would you give him a hand? It is a breath of encouragement and fresh air in. I know I told this story a little bit, and I don't know if you're going to hear this testimony tonight or Sunday. But tomorrow, tonight is training. Amen. Tomorrow, Thursday, in the afternoon, 5.30ish, at Buena Park. But before that, in the morning and in the afternoon, uh, we will have outreach right here at the Lighthouse in this general area. We're going to be handing out these door hangers. And if you haven't gotten one yet, if you haven't crossed the street of your neighbor, get one of these. Put your name in the back so they know who you are. You can contact you. Amen. And let's pray. Let's pray that God would heal them in Jesus' name. And then in before Buena Park, we're going to out, do outreach at our house for the Connect Group for Friday. 
and then we're going to go to Buena Park. So those of you that are able to do that, I want to encourage you to be a part of this in Jesus' name. Of course, this Sunday, we will have Dr. Braden with us. Amen. You've received this via email. Text it to your friends. To invite somebody. Compel them to come. Amen. Would you stand? Amen. And would you lift up your hands? Would you worship the Lord right now? Christ. We praise you, oh God. We praise you, oh God. Amen. I'm going to bring to this podium, Brother Braden Anderson. Amen. He is a joy to have. Very, very cool guy. We went outreach with him, and Dana wasn't feeling too good, but when we came home, she asked his brother, so, so what's Brother Anderson like? Dylan goes, he's a cool guy. Amen. And he really is. Would you come, my dear brother? Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. How many are glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. I'm excited about what God is doing, and I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful. Uh, for what's happening in our midst. I think it's an exciting time in the church and exciting time in this church. And I think God's going to do something tremendous on Sunday. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your presence and your power. God, there's none like you. Oh, you Jesus. Amen. God is good. God is good. Well, uh, I'm excited for tonight. I'm going to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. Out of habit, I'm going to look down at my notes every now and then, but I have preached these scriptures enough. It is not necessary. I love these. There's a, we're not going to cover much, but I think these are some of the most foundational scriptures on church growth in the Bible. And uh, they're really big deal ones. If you wanted to learn them, I wouldn't be offended. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and 6 here, look how short that is. If you want to learn that, what is it, 5, 10 words, something like that? I, you know, so we, we could master that one. It says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Amen. I give honor to your pastor and his wife. And uh, I'll say this much, of the churches that we get to go to and and this is what we do every, every weekend, every day. This is what we do. The churches we go to, probably 70 to 80% have their pastor come on at least one outreach while we're there. But only 5% have the pastor and the pastor's wife show up at at least one outreach while we're there. So you're in the top 5% of churches in the nation. And that tells me that we're not a church that maybe wants revival or revival if it's convenient, but from the top down, we're going to have revival. Amen. Amen. And uh, so I was excited about that. I was excited to see family. And, man, we had a great team out on outreach. You know, that many people once a week, we can make a difference in this city. So thank you so much for those of you that were there. I know you could have been a million other places, but you were out with us at Walmart wearing our Walmart Power Sunday shirts, and God did some great things. Let's pray tonight that the Lord would speak to us. Amen. I'm going to teach. I'm, I'm not going to preach. I'm going to teach tonight, but i got to cram a lot of content into our minds real quick and want it to catch. I want it to sink in. Amen. Lord, I pray right now that the Holy Ghost would have its way tonight. I pray that, God, you would inspire us, that you would instruct us, Lord, if there's anything we could refine, that we could improve. I pray that you would let it stand out in our minds. I pray every individual, man, woman, and child would be challenged to do something for you. God, use us and let us be effective for the kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can put your Bibles down and let's give the Lord one more hand clap of praise tonight.
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I want to speak tonight on the subject of let's increase. Let's increase. Say that. Let's increase. Amen. 1 Corinthians 3 and 6 says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. You know, uh, so let me just, uh, and, uh, let me give you an introduction, if for no other reason than habit. But I Googled how to make bread. You know, bread, I really love cooking, but bread is the one thing that has evaded me all of my life. I will produce, every time that I attempt bread, I will produce either a whopping load of dough. Just spits right back out of the oven. An entire bowl of soup is the bread that I make. Or a blackened hockey puck will emerge from the oven. And I somehow am never able to get it to successfully land in between the two. If anybody can teach me how to make bread, that would be a blessing. But I googled how to make bread. One Point one two billion results on Google for how to make bread. That just increases my confusion level. But you know what's interesting is no matter which one of those recipes you open on how to make bread, there's going to be some fundamentals that are always the same. Flour, water, some raising agent, some seasoning ingredients. There's always going to be some of the same. Some differences, but some are the same. In the church, there are three basic ingredients to revival. I don't care if you have a big church or a small church. I don't care if you got a church painted yellow or a church painted red. That You have to plant, you have to water, and God has to bring the increase. It may look a little different. You may do a little bit more of one than the other. You might do it a little different than the guy down the street. But success will come by planting, watering, and God giving the increase. So, when you hear terms like that, what does it sound like to you? I hear a lot of action words. Now, how many people believe one day that they will, I've never said this before, it just occurred to me. How many people believe one day they're going to open their oven, a perfectly baked loaf of bread will have spontaneously emerged overnight? Man, I wish that would happen in my house. It would solve my cooking dilemma. How many people believe that one day, though, they're going to walk into the church and spontaneously it will be full? Spontaneously there will be healing Spontaneously people will be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost Friend that is not how it works The scripture has these action words Plant, water, God giving increase So revival will not be random Revival will be like bread If we follow the recipe we're going to get an outcome If we don't follow the recipe it's not going to happen Amen. But that means that we can have revival. That means God can bring an increase. That means miracles can happen. That means God can fill with the Holy Ghost. People can get healing. Come on, somebody. It can happen. All right. So that's my fancy introduction. Plant, water, increase. Say it. Plant, water, increase. All right. Let's talk about planting today. If we fail to plant, the plants will fail. So I often use this illustration. I think it's the most relevant. But uh, let's say I want to be a farmer. Now, now, I'm full city slicker through and through. I know nothing about farming, okay? I imagine Southern California, some of you don't know anything about farming either. So don't you make fun of me. For a little while, I lived in uh, eastern Washington. I was in a smaller city, and I saw farming. You, you knew when it was going down because your car was always covered in dust. Because they were out there cutting things and churning things. I don't even know what they do. But it made the whole city affected uh, by when it would be harvest season or when it would be planting time of year. Anyways, if I wanted to be a farmer, and granted I know little about it, here is how I would embark. I would find a piece of land. And man, I'm not being mean. I ain't farming in Southern California. You guys are in perpetual drought. I would look around the United States for the most fertile piece of land. Where I could get some bang for my buck. buck. It would have streams running through it. It would be a place that's known to have some underground water I could tap into and get some free irrigation. I mean, I would buy me a piece of lush land. And let me tell you what I would do next. I would begin to hire everybody else's 
uh, uh, my competitors, managers from their fields. I would poach them over to my company. I would hire me some laborers. I would hire me some people for the harvest, people for the plant. I mean, I would have a team, and they would be trained, and they'd have uniforms. They'd look great. Then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy the greatest instruments of farming there's ever been. Now, I actually, one time I was in a doctor's waiting room. I have no idea why this was there. There was a farming magazine. And, uh, and literally, it was like Combines US or something crazy like that. And I picked it up. I was so intrigued. I'm like, what in the world is this? And I get to turn in the pages, and I, I learned about Combines. Man, I, you think that your Tesla is cool? You need to buy yourself a Combine. They're like a quarter million dollars. You know that? Under the combine, there are these sensors, and they literally calculate the number of seeds per square inch that they could put into the ground. And, I mean, they, they are more efficient than a human being who could put them in manually, and they guarantee higher yields sevenfold out of the... I mean, they're just remarkable machines, different attachments, and on and on. So, you know what I'm going to do at my field is I'm going to go get me some big bank loans, and I'm going to buy the best combines in the market. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to call Albertson, Safeway, Costco, all them, and I'm going to undercut my competitor. I'm going to line up some contracts. I'm going somewhere with this. Just stay with me, right? And here's what I'm going to say. Hey, I know that you have been getting uh, your supply uh, from my competitor, but I'm the new guy in town, and tell me what you're getting it from them for, and I'll give it to you for less. So here's what I've got. I've got land. I've got combines. I've got people. I've got managers. And then I'm going to build me the barns. And man, you have not seen barns till you've seen my barns. They're going to be big. They're going to have front door, back door. They're going to have second, third story. They're going to be climate controlled barns. I'm going to build me some barns. Check it out. Should I do all of those things? I have the people, I have the barns, I have the land, I have the irrigation, I have the contracts, I have the business cards, I have all of what it takes to run a business. But should I never put seed in the field, what measure of harvest will I have? Now let me tell you where the church does this wrong, because we do the same thing. Our pastors, our leadership teams, even our people get real excited about building. I don't care what your barn looks like. We get real excited about buying a shiny church van. I don't care what your combines look like. We get real excited about somebody moving in from out of state who's apostolic from somewhere else. They, they come to this city and they move into our church. That's great. But I don't care how many laborers you have sitting in the barn. Come on, somebody. I don't care how nice the business cards. I don't care how nice the website. I don't care how great the music. Uh, come on. If we never put seed in the field, there is no harvest. It doesn't matter how great all all of the other details are at some point we just get out there and we plant seed we talk to people we teach bible studies we love on somebody we do evangelism everywhere that we go we have to be busy about planning second corinthians 9 and 6 says he that sows sparingly will reap sparingly and he that sows bountifully will reap bountifully. There is a law of the harvest that if you do nothing, you get nothing. If you do little, you get little. But if you do more than anybody else, you're going to get more than anybody else. Come on, somebody. I know there's other churches in the city. That's okay because we're going to do more than they do. I know that there's other places that they can go, but not other places that'll love them like we will, that'll spend time with them like we will, that'll love on them, give rides to them, Bible studies to them, time with them. Come on, I want to plant more that I might have more. Galatians 6 and 9 says, don't be weary in well-doing, in due season we'll reap if we faint not. When I get to talking like this, people start getting a little uncomfortable because what I'm talking about represents work. That is the truth of what I'm saying. Just to be secular for a second, I started a business. And one turned into two, turned into three, turned into four businesses. 
when I started those businesses, I had a different, and I couldn't take on business partners because I don't think like them. I wanted to have a big business. And that meant that when my business made its first $10 in profit, there was a decision point where I had to decide, am I going to take that 10 and put it in my pocket, or am I going to leave that 10 in the bank account that I might buy another business tomorrow? That I might buy a building tomorrow. That I might hire somebody else tomorrow. Okay? So my philosophy was I'm not going to uh, poach from it. Instead, I'm going to work harder that it might grow. And I went and got second jobs and third jobs and got paid from those so that I wouldn't have to take from the business and the business could grow. So here's what I'm saying. If we as a church... Come in and use this as a place to be comfortable and a place to be fed and a place to receive. And we go back home and we do not work. That is a recipe for a church that stays the same. A church that doesn't grow. A church without new blood. But if we say, you know what, I'm going to play the long term game here. I'm going to put in more work than anybody else would. I'm going to give this thing more time than anybody else would. It will be painful in the beginning, but that's a recipe to grow the church. To grow the church. So, and then the other way that this conversation is about to make you uncomfortable, and because it's about to get really like tangible and where the rubber meets the road, is it's going to feel for a few minutes like I've removed God from the equation in church growth. And, uh, I actually think that is the right way to approach church growth. We ought to go after this city as though God himself isn't going after this city. And it's all up to us. That's not the reality. God does go with us. But when we treat it like that, like it's all up to me, like it's all up to my family, like it's all up to our outreach. And then God goes with us. The results are exponential. And we'll get to that part where God comes into the equation. Uh, don't get me wrong. Without Him, there's no birth, new, new birth. There's no miracles. There's no breakthrough. There's no Holy Ghost. But without you and the method of God in Scripture, there is nobody new coming through those doors to get the Holy Ghost and to get a miracle and to get a breakthrough. So we act. We plant. We water. Then God brings the increase. All right, so again, let's talk some planting. Okay, so uh, it's not in here, but I'll just tell you this little quick story. I was on the YouTubes, and I ran into this guy called Darren Brown. Not a preacher at all, but he put this video up, and it's very interesting. So he picks up a group of advertising executives at the airport, okay? I'm going to just... For sake of demonstration. He picks them up at the airport. He loads them into a limousine. And he drives these executives across the city. And to this hotel where he's rented a conference room. So they come into the hotel uh, elevator. They go up the elevator. And he brings them into a conference room. In the conference room. And this is all on film for you when you're watching this YouTube video. right? In the conference room. This is what he tasked them with, and they had no idea this was coming. He sits with those executives, and he says, I am going to come out with a new company. It's going to be a zoo, and I want you guys to make the logo for me. I'm going to give you no guidance. Just you decide amongst yourselves what you want. I want a logo, and I want a slogan. Now, he said, I'm going to take my, uh, I have an envelope. He had a sealed envelope. He said, I'm going to take my sealed envelope. I'm going to leave it in the middle of the table, the conference room table. You guys have your easel up there. Draw whatever you want, and I'll come back in 20 minutes. He steps out of the room. All right. So he comes back in 20 minutes, whatever. And when he comes into the room, he says, okay, show me what you got. And he peels uh, it back, and he takes a look, and they have made a logo for the zoo, and they've made a slogan that he's going to use for his company. He says, all right, perfect. 
He says, okay, now I'm not going to touch it, but I want somebody to pick up that envelope that's been sealed and sitting here the whole time, and I want you to see what's in that envelope. And when they open the envelope, it is the identical logo and the identical slogan. And he said, man, that's quite a magic trick, isn't it? Look at me, right? But then what he does for you on YouTube is he says, let me show you how I did it. He plays the tape back. When he picked him up from the airport, everything that took place between there and the conference room was orchestrated. When they sat inside that limo, little hints of the logo were inside. As they drove down the street and would look out the window, there was a, a group of, uh, a school group, young kids, that were wearing t-shirts like our Power Sunday shirts. And on those t-shirts was the logo. A little bit later, there's some kids that accidentally let their balloons go. And on those balloons was the logo. And as they went a little further down the road, uh, uh, the, it would appear again. Now they come into the hotel. When they got into the elevator, and they're going up the elevator, on the side of the elevator, inside, there was a picture on the wall, and the slogan that he wanted them to come up with was written there. So when they come into the conference room, they have no idea. They've been looking at it all day long. When they come into the conference room, and they have the opportunity to make their their own choice, their mind defaults to what they have seen the most. And they regurgitate out what they have seen the most, not even knowing it. Why do I bring it up? Because the church which will take the city is the one that they have seen the most. If we can get into their Facebook, if we can get into their workplace, if you can hang a door hanger, come on somebody if you could invite them at Walmart if you could be there through a trial I'm telling you that when it comes time for them to finally choose a church all the churches might look the same on the outside but they will go with the one that they have been seeing the one they've been hearing the one that's been impacting them the one that does the events in the community the one that's been planting. We need to be busy about planting. Now let me talk to you about what that could look like. Planting it often involves a discussion around advertising. Uh, we certainly do a lot of advertising. We do met websites, mailers, social media, Facebook, Instagram, Google, Twitter, wherever the people are. Radio, newspaper, billboards, t-shirts, I don't care. Advertising is kind of an unlimited bucket, actually. You could spend 400 grand if you want. You could spend $40 if you want. But, there's, but we will have to do some measure of advertising. But there are three big things that every church will need to master if they're going to be good at planting. Everybody say, I want to have a planting church. All right, I don't know as it stands today. I don't know what you regularly do. So if you don't do one of these, it, I said it on accident by total accidental ignorance. But this is in general what we would pitch to you. One. We need to have lifestyle outreach. Somebody say that. Lifestyle. lifestyle outreach. I wasn't even planning this. I just instinctively did it when I came in tonight. Uh, pastor, he doesn't know me yet, so he wouldn't know that I like this. But when I get to a church, I like to have some of their cards. So when I came in, I didn't ask him. I stole some of your cards. And I put them in my pocket. The easiest way to think about lifestyle outreach is it is what's in your pocket. What's in your pocket. The other thing I like to do is I like to steal these from the hotel, the sleeves. These sleeves. Because then the pocket doesn't get degraded. This, see, I got one from the last church I was at. And I stick it in the sleeve with my hotel key. And it's in my pocket every day, everywhere I go. Now, what I'm going to do with your card is it's going to live in the sleeve too. And everywhere I go, that card goes. Now, check this out. I don't know how many people are in this room, but let's say that we made it part of our lifestyle, lifestyle, that we took at least two cards a week and we gave them out, just two a week. You do the math. 52 weeks a year times two, that's 104 invitations times how many are in this room. Friend, that is 
thousands of people that would be personally invited. Let me tell you why we need lifestyle outreach. I am not going to go to the McDonald's you go to. I'm not going to go to the bank that you go to. I don't work where you do. I don't go to the schools you do. If you take those cards where you go, your sphere of influence is further than mine. I not might not make it to their door, but you're right in front of them. Your invitation is as good as mine. Put the cards in your pocket. Put them in your purse. And everywhere you go, give them out. Give them out. Just two. Can we commit to two? Everybody hold your twos up. Hold your two up. Two a week. Just two a week. If a church can't master lifestyle evangelism, they're going to have a church growth problem. Because if you don't even have enough of a heart to invite two people as you come and go, if God gives us two people in here, they're not going to find a friend. They're not going to find a mentor. They're not going to find somebody that will love on them. But the churches I see that grow the most, they have a culture that's already invested in evangelizing everywhere they go. Everybody they talk to, there's a card. When they go out to eat, they leave a card. It's just what they do. It's who they are. That's a church God can trust with an increase because he knows you're going to take care of them. It's already part of you. So lifestyle outreach, okay? And again, I, I, I mean, this is an example. This is silly, but... Uh, in a way, I guess I could also pull up your Facebook and see if, if lifestyle outreach is part of who you are. Some people's Facebook, all it is is pictures of their food and their ultrasounds and their babies. Man, there should if you love Jesus like you say you do, there should be some Jesus in the mix too. That's okay. Uh, now, let's say the next dynamic of, of a church should be scheduled outreach. I know you had at least one because I was there. But we should have scheduled outreach. That might look like door knocking. That might look like door hangers. That might look like parking lots. That might look like Walmart. That could look like homeless stuff, street evangelism, whatever. But we have to have some form of together corporate outreach that we put on the calendar. Sometimes pastors will call me and they'll say, as though I know I've not been there. But they'll say, man, I just need you to tell me what I'm doing wrong and what we could do better. I'm thinking, bro, I ain't even been to your church. But if I had to answer that real quick, I'll just say read me your schedule for the next three months and if they don't say outreach at one point in the next three months oh, we can stop right there bro I can tell you what you're doing wrong you need to get your people off the seat and onto the street now let me give you some realities about scheduled outreach I talked some about this today uh, as we were out there there's a lot of ways that we can refine this over time. First, just do it. And then we can refine it. How I refine it over time is I begin to use door knocking in the right neighborhoods where door knocking is most effective. I use door hangers in the neighborhoods. That's the most effective. If I'm talking to people, I will talk to people of a certain income class in a certain neighborhood that don't mind being interrupted through the day and spoken to. It will start where if you don't know what you're doing, you will see one in 1,000 people will respond to cold contact outreach like that, scheduled, one in 1,000. When I go to churches that don't know their city at all and they're not doing anything, we're going to go out and outreach, I'll tell them I want you to have 10,000 door hangers and flyers ready. 10,000, because I want 10 guests on Sunday. If you give me 500, we will have no one on Sunday. I'll tell them that, just straight up like that. And they're like, <gasps> and I'm like, yeah, we need 10,000. Now, if I knew your city better, and I know what neighborhoods to go to, I know where the poor people live and the hungry people are, I can get way better ratios, but for now, start with that. You learn more about it, and you can refine it after you've started doing it. But if you don't go and you don't do it, you're not going to learn your city and your people. Now, the last I would mention about planting, and this is where, I, again, I don't know if you guys do this or don't do this. But the third dynamic is event outreach. Event outreach can get very, for the pastor, it can get very uncomfortable because it is hard work and it's very expensive. But I would push you uh, all of you in this church to pray about 
events you can be involved with and you can make more grand than you've ever had before. Let me give you an example. Pastor says, hey, I, you know, we're going to have a special Easter service. Your mind should start turning as to how you can make that the biggest Easter service we've ever had. And you need to go bug your pastor about enlarging that vision. Pastor, could we have inflatables at Easter? Can I get involved with the kids and run a special kids program upstairs while you're down here? Pastor, I got an idea for Easter to make it bigger. If you'll let me, I'll run with it. The bigger you can make an event, the more God can show up and honor that faith and show out. We, I, I mean, there's so many examples I could give you. I, I, I like to tell at least just the one story. If I could just give you one story. There was one pastor, he, he went out on a limb by faith, puts together the strangest events you've ever imagined. So he decides that we're going to have outdoor, you know, Holy Ghost music, all this stuff. And then we're going to do some fireworks and some this and that. We're going to have a stage. We're going to connect with people, just like a massive block party thing. And so we're setting it all up, and he's called me to be a part of it. And I get there with my little rental car or whatever, and he says, bro, I need your rental car key. And this is a church that doesn't have a huge amount of people. And I hand my keys over to him, and I say, bro, what are you going to do with my car? And he's like, I need your car to mark the end of where all the other cars are going to come and be lined up so they know where to park for this event. I say, all right, man, well, here you go. So I hop in the car with him, and the pastor is driving my little, I don't know, you know, 1820 Prius or whatever old thing they gave me. And he drives. He had bought a property that's 11 acres long. It's a big rectangle. And that dude drove and drove and drove. And I, I'm like, man, what are you doing? And I'm like, you're driving so far, and it's like 400 degrees outside. Now we're going to have to walk back 11 acres to where we started. And he said, I'm believing that this is going to be the end of where they're parked. He drove my car all the way down, parks it so stinking far away, and then we walked back. That pastor had, again, it's not a significantly sized church, but he must have been at least five, $8,000 deep in that event. The amount of popcorn we made, the amount of cotton candy we made. We had lemon slurpy things, all kinds of diabetes in a cup. I mean, we had, we went crazy for this event. And you know what's funny? He had never ran it before. He had no clue how many people would show up. It was all an act of faith. We went, and at the time that that event started, I looked out, and I kid you not, my car was the very last car in the lineup of people that came we had over 1,000 first time guests right here in America he just ran that same event again this year and they had over 4,000 people this year at that event you know everybody says until they've done one we're not big enough we don't have enough money we don't do stuff like that I have heard every excuse in the book but what if we just thought God was big enough and God could do something what if and we decided we'll spend it we'll raise it we'll work it we'll do it and see what God can do man I've seen block parties that blow your mind we, we just did a block party a little while ago in 12 minutes 12 minutes of me talking to somebody we baptized the first two people at that block party you know you have no idea what God could do right here in this city in this church but we've got to open our minds to thinking bigger man tent revivals this I know this is metro and tent revival may not make sense here but I'm just to use an example tent revivals are crazy Man, some people call me and say, I want to do a tent revival. I'm just, Man, that is the hardest thing you could possibly ask me to do. I have to drive out there with trailers and poles and 6,000 pounds of this. And I have to have a tractor and put things in and stages and electrical and generators and bathrooms and lights. And you need registration teams and altar teams. We're going to have to have a baptismal. And who's going to fill a 500-gallon baptismal in the middle of a field? So you're going to have to call the fire department. And, man, it's so hard. You, and, yes, I will be there. And it's going to be awesome. And God's going to fill everybody with the Holy Ghost. Amen. We got to go bigger. Got to go bigger. The most common problem with our planting is simply there is not enough. There is not enough. And there is a law that the more we do, the more God will bring his increase. Let me talk about watering. Somebody say watering. 
You know, we put that slide up there that said each one reach one. Each one reach one. One of the best ways that you can make an impact in somebody's life this year is if you'll be busy about watering. Again, just like I gave you that story about, you know, if I was a farmer and, and all that sort of jive, uh, it would be equally as absurd for me to go put all that seed out in my field and then never water it. It's going to die. It's going to die. Watering is part of the process. You start watering as soon as you put the seed in the ground. You have to care for them or they will not make it. They will not be back. And that starts then as soon as you encounter them. As soon as you encounter them. Now, I got here before most of you guys. So I have no idea what it looks like out in that parking lot. Like literally, there was like my car and like two or three other cars. So I have no idea what's happening. But on Sunday, if I was new, is there a place that I could park by the door? Or did you all steal those spots and I'm hoofing it from the back? And then when I come in here, is anybody going to shake my hand? Or am I going to be like, which door do I go in? Or do I go upstairs? And, and then when I come through those doors and, man, you got prayer going on. And prayer is powerful. But it's also super confusing if you come in here Catholic. Man, you're used to nothing leading up to service. And then when service starts, it's still nothing. Man, they're going to come in here and, man, some brother's over here doing the funky chicken. Somebody's gnawing on the wall over there. They have no idea what's going on. You know what they're going to do? They may just turn around and walk right back out. But what if somebody came as they came through that door and said, man, I'm so glad you're here. We're just having some prayer before service. Would you come and sit with me? Watering. Watering. I like to do this illustration. Man, can I, can I borrow you? I'll just, I'm going to promise I'm not going to pick on you too much. Um, so if he comes and he visits, this is another really key thing we understand. When he goes back out. Girl, let me have you put your hand. And I'll borrow you. Come on over. And just, just put a hand on this arm. All right. So this is going to be his sister. His, Right? His sister hates God, hates God, hates the idea of her brother ever going to church. When he gets home from the service on Sunday, that's what she's going to tell him. All right, come on. Man, this is best friend. Well, then go ahead, grab on that arm somewhere, wherever you can reach. Yeah, well, that'll work too, either way, whatever's good for you. All right, this is best friend. His best friend used to go to church, and she got burned. And now she believes like every pastor just wants to buy a new Versace suit with his money. As you could tell from Pastor's Versace suit, I'm sure it's Versace. I know how you roll. <laughs> so she's going to tell him, bro, don't trust churches, man. All they want is your money. And this guy, do you know what's crazy here? This is banker. He doesn't even have a relationship with him. But when he goes to the bank, you know what he's going to tell him? Man, I am so glad that I live in Southern California. Because in Southern California, nobody believes in God. It's just crazy that people would believe in God. That's his banker. Go ahead and make a connection somewhere here. So to, on that arm, somewhere. So watch this, anywhere you want, yeah. So, so look at this. When he leaves us on Sunday, he has got at least three people pulling him from ever coming back. We are not going to see this dude again unless when he comes through that door, he's got at least one person Pulling him back. All right, you guys can sit down. Thank you. I want that illustration just to stick with you right now, okay? When they go back, they go back to families that don't go to church. They go back to friends that don't go to church or else we'd know them too, right? They go back out to a workplace that doesn't go to church. They go back to practices that don't look Christian. They go back to alcohol, back to cigarettes, back to whatever. If they don't have us, we don't see them again. That's watering. So let me then ask you this question. What would that look like tangibly? You know, we, I, I, uh, one of the greatest things that you can do when you're a Pentecostal preacher is you can plagiarize. This isn't some English class. You can steal whatever you want. So I ran into a guy, and, and he said that, man, I can keep like 90% of the people that come through my doors. And I said, you a liar, bro. And he said, no, for real. I can keep at least 80%, but usually 90% of the people that walk through my doors. And I said, show me how. And he showed me the method. That, I looked at it, I'm like, bro, 
What kind of slavery operation are you running out of your church? You got your people working this hard. I said, I couldn't ever mirror this. And he said, that's fine, man. Just do what you can. So I plagiarized most of it. And I did a little study in my church. What I did in my church was I asked everybody in the church. I pitched it like this. I said, we're going to run a program that now is not going to rely on me as the preacher. It's not going to rely on pastor. It's going to rely on you. And I'm going to assign you one person. Each one of us is going to get one person assigned to us that comes through those doors. That's going to be who you mentor. That's going to be who you remind to come to church. That's going to be who you take out to Starbucks. That's going to be your new best friend. And you're going to stay their best friend until they can come back to church on their own without somebody reminding them. Now, I gave them a program because, you know, you got to really spell it out. And I said, this is what this is how you're going to be a friend. On Monday, you're going to do this. On Tuesday, you're going to do this. On Wednesday, you're going to do this. On Sunday, you're going to do this. You're going to take them out to lunch here. You're going to try and babysit their kids here. You're going to take offer them dominoes. You're going to take them to Starbucks. But you're going to get in their life. And you're not going to do it one week, one time. You're going to do this every single week until they're stable. They want a Bible study. You teach a Bible study. But just one, just one. You know, you expect, I hate to say it, but the unspoken thing is we expect pastor to do all that junk. How many can we grow by if pastor's the one that has to do all that? Have you thought about that? Like how much bandwidth does one man have? So here's, I'm going to tell you what happened when I wrote that out. Just like anything else, I had some that complied and some that didn't. And that actually worked out really good for my statistics as I was gathering the numbers back. Bad for the people, but good for the statistics. Some people, when I would give them an assignment, I would usually hand them a card. And it had the visitor's name and phone number and address, all that. I would give them the card. And I don't know what they did with it. I don't know if they used it to go home and roll a joint and they smoked it. But that they did squat with that card. They did nothing. They said, I'll do it. And then they did nothing. For the group that got nobody loving on them, nobody mentoring on them, no phone calls to remind them to come back to church, nobody offered them a ride, nobody took them to Starbucks, nobody befriended them, nobody helped them fill out a resume for their first job, whatever they needed. Nobody was that person. Nobody was pulling back. We had 16% that were still coming back to our church six months out. That number is called our natural retention rate. If you have the best church in America, I don't know, maybe you can get it up to 25%. Like when you come in here, everything is polished and pristine. You give your visitors $200 Starbucks cards. Thanks for visiting. Red carpet comes down when they walk in. Maybe 25% will be bringing themselves back. I don't know. If you got the worst church in America, and man, the, 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 the person up here singing has got like perpetual laryngitis. Nobody practices and, you know, all that sort of... Just a mess of a church. Maybe your number's 5%. I don't know. Every church has a natural retention rate. And if you don't have a follow-up program, you're probably living in it right now. Let me tell you what happened on this side. There was another group that did everything I told them to. Everything I told them to. And measured six months later, we still had 74% of those people coming back every single service. Okay, here's where it stings. You ready for this? I'll just say it quick and then I'll move off, I promise, because it actually hurts me too to even say it. The pastor was the same. The messages were the same. The music was the same. Pre-service prayer was the same. The only thing that was different was what you did to try and keep them. So watch this. Imagine answering to God for the difference between 74% and 16%. The people that could have been saved if you exhibited some degree of effort to keep them. That stings, right? Man, I, I, I said that, I remember I said that once, like, oh my Lord, you've got to help me be better at this. You've got to help me always be looking for somebody to be under my wing. Somebody I can be mentoring, be helping, be loving on. And you know what? It's actually a lot of fun. Because sinners can say jokes I can't say. I love hanging out with sinners. It's super funny. 
<laughs> you know, I could go to Starbucks with them and have a good time. I can meet real estate agents. I can meet people getting off heroin every walk of life. I can meet red, yellow, black, and white. It doesn't matter to me. I love people. I'm in the people business. Give me somebody I can love on. Now, as, as I was praying about what to, to do here tonight, I'm watching my, looking at my timer. I'll be done here shortly. I, I felt really impressed to tell you a story about one guy. Uh, and I'm putting this under my watering section. And the reason is, and I've never really told his story, but the reason is you live in the shadow of a big church, you know. And he, and in the city we lived in, we had a big church. Mars Hill was also in Bellevue where we started a church. Mars Hill, pastored by Mark Driscoll, is another one of these huge mega churches, multiple campuses, millions of dollars coming in. You know, he writes books, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we ran into this one individual who, who was uh, in his church, and he was extremely enthusiastic for the Lord. And somebody would say, man, that is a difficult person to reach because they believe they're saved. They believe that they're, you know, serving the Lord. They're going to a great church. Great things are happening, man. That, that's somebody that, you know, you just can't. You just can't. Well, our approach with him was a little bit different. When, when I met him, what I simply said is, man, it is so good to have you visiting us. Uh, tell me more about your church. Tell me more about what you want to see God do and what's going on. And he told me about his great church and great messages, the great singers that they have. I said, okay, man, well, tell me about what you get to do. What you get to do. What you have seen. What miracles have happened at your hands. And he told me this story. He said, I, I expressed interest in being one of their leaders. And I was added to their pastoral team. He said their pastoral team has somewhere around 200 staff pastors. And what that team does each week is that team all week long will try and come up with a sermon idea. And they'll submit their ideas to the lead pastor. And then the lead pastor will accept one of the ideas. And then when he accepts the idea, then the rest of the team will all write a sermon and submit it to him. And then he'll take from their sermons and that is his Sunday sermon. And I said, so let me get this straight. As a leader, you don't sing, you don't preach, you don't pray with people, you don't teach Bible studies. You're just a uh, submission, a submitter of content. And he said, yes, exactly. And I said, man, I, I think that's awesome that you've got to do that. But maybe God's growing you to the place that you're going to get to preach your own sermon one day. I said, man... We couldn't get you doing that overnight, but I really believe that God could use you here. I could see you praying in the altar with people. I could see you working with kids and working with youth. I could see you teaching Bible studies one day. If you want to be more involved than you are right now, we would love to have you be part of us. I know he wasn't perfect overnight, but that was enough that I could be involved with you in a way I'm not involved there, that we got him like that. Now, when he came in, he needed some love. And so I decided, man, he's going to be under my wing. And what that looked like is I listened to what he needed. I spent, we did some time. We went to a few meals, whatever. But I listened to what he needed. His family ended up getting in a tight spot financially. And so I don't do this all the time because I only have one guest room. But I said, bro, if you need it, I got a free place you could stay. You, your wife, your kids, just move into my house for as long as you need it. Long as you need it, no big deal. And he's like, man, what about rent and all that stuff? I, man, the place like that, I would owe this, that, and the other. I'm like, bro, man, don't even care. Don't even worry about the rent. We just want to bless you. And when he's in my house, what do you think I did? Man, I brainwashed him all the time. And I mentored him, and I loved on him. I taught him the word, whatever. Dude became just solid leader. So here's what I'm saying. What if there were people across the city right now and yeah, they go to a big church, and they hear better music. They have better lights. They have a better nursery program, whatever. But what if those people really wanted to do something for God? What if they really wanted to see a miracle with their own eyes and see a miracle? What if they wanted to be part of a church that was warm and accepting, somewhere that they could bring their lost family members, and the pastor would come learn their name? If we give them an opportunity to be involved, and we'll take them under our wing. We are more powerful than them being some nameless number in the back of a mega auditorium. We don't have to be intimidated by being in the shadow of some big building. Come on, we have a big God and we're part of a big church. I 
really believe that. All right, last, I have to say this part quick, but the end of that scripture is, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. God gave the increase. I, I believe that if we create space for God to bring, bring the increase, that this isn't just something, this isn't just a marketing ploy. This isn't just a math equation about number of seeds planted, number of water distributed, and, you know, it, it's a success recipe for growing a church. There is also this wonderful factor about when somebody comes in who is lost and we begin to worship and the presence of the Lord fills this room. There is something that begins to happen as the glory of the Lord descends that cannot be planned. It can't be arranged. It can't be fabricated. It can't be hyped. It is the authentic touch of the creator of God Almighty the only one that has the power to remit sin the only one that has the power to deliver come on the only one that can work victory and miracles God can bring the increase we have to create space and an atmosphere for God to bring the increase all right so let me just give you one nugget on how that's going to work and this applies on Sunday when it's that critical time that we want to see God move on the hearts of men, uh, we have got to all be bought in to what's happening. So, I don't know, how many of you weren't raised going to church? How many? I was raised Catholic, so I'm just going to put my hand up, basically not going to church. All right, so look at all of us. I don't know if you guys ever did this, but here's what I did. I did, I did a side eye for Jesus. So when I came and I was visiting, and that preacher say, raise your hands, I just quickly snuck me a side-eye glance to see, do I really have to raise my hands? Because if I can find even one person, I'm point where nobody's sitting. <laughs> if I could find one person sitting in the back that's not raising their hands, you just gave me permission. I don't have to raise mine. If this guy says, man, I want everybody to come up here and pray, and I could find two people that don't, I know I don't really have to go up. But if when he says, raise your hands, and I look around and every hand is lifted, I would look like the odd duck out if I don't lift mine. When he says, lift your voice, and every voice is lifted, I would look like the odd duck out if I don't lift mine. Do you get what I'm saying? If everybody comes forward, if everybody's seeking God, if everybody's speaking in tongues, I'm telling you, you create an atmosphere and a momentum for God to bring the increase. For God to bring the increase. On Sunday, we need your help. For God to move on them. You might not be the pastor, but you absolutely set the tone for what God can do. Just like that. When you make up your mind that I'm going to worship, I'm going to be involved, I'm going to come to the front. It sets the atmosphere for what God can do. The Bible says these signs shall follow them that believe. Come on somebody, he can do it. He can do it. If you have expectation and you have faith, show me. On Sunday. Amen. We plant, we water, and God does it from there. Amen. I, I was, I, man, I just inquire of Brother Google all kinds of weird things. I asked this question to Brother Google. Do farmers store seeds? And I, I assume the answer was, as I found it to be, farmers do not store seeds. You know, if we're going to, have a mighty corn company. Whatever we prepare to put in the ground, we have to put it in. We don't leave it in the barn for next year. Because a seed that is sat on is a seed that's wasted and dies. There's only a few places that have the capacity for temperature, climate, humidity control that can actually store seed. Every seed that's not planted dies. I want us to have that urgency in our spirit. When we're not planning, when we're not watering, when we're not creating an atmosphere for God to do something, we are going to see the death of many great seeds. 
But if we're busy about putting things in the ground and we're a people that water and we create an atmosphere, there is going to be a harvest and revival in our midst. Come on, somebody. Don't say that you'll do something next year. Don't wait for the right song to motivate you. Don't wait wait for the right preacher, the right conference. I'm telling you, if you would plant seed today, if you would water seed today, if you would let God bring the increase today, there absolutely can and absolutely will be revival. Amen. Amen. If you stand together with me tonight. Amen. We have seen growth in every state we have ever been to, in every city we have ever been to, in every church we have ever been to. We have been in cities as small as 1,200 people with Baptist churches that seem like they run about 1,100 and still seen 40 first-time visitors. We've been in churches of 40 people and had 80 first-time visitors. Like I said, we've seen events. They've had 4,000 first-time visitors. I believe God can do it here. I believe God can do it now. I believe there's enough of them out there. I heard enough talent in here. We're the variable. We're the variable between where we are and where we want to get. Amen. Is there anybody in this place that wants to see a revival? Hallelujah. Amen. As pastor, I, I guess it was pre, pre-preaching me here. He said a scripture that is really important. And I, I wasn't sure if I'd include it. But let me say it to you. In Luke 14, this precedes the story of the prodigal son. Prodigal Sons, Luke 15. It's Luke 14, verse 16. He said it quickly, but I want you to catch this. The Bible gives us this parable, Jesus speaking, red letters, and he paints us a picture of church growth. He says, a certain man is making a great supper, and he wants many to be there. And he sends his servant at supper time to go out. And they go out, and they say, come, for all things are now ready. I know this is a church that has went out and made some invitations like that. Come to church. Come check it out. Come see us. Come feel the power of God. Well, look at what happened, though. The Bible says that they began to make excuses. The first one said, I I bought some ground and I have to see it and excuse me. Another said, I have bought some oxen. I have to prove them. Excuse me. Another said, I married a wife. I got family things to do. and I cannot come. Well, you would think that when... The servants approach that Lord that he would say to them, good job, you tried. Let's sit down and just have dinner. Just us, me, you, the family, have good church and go back home. But the servant came and showed the Lord these things. And the Bible says then the master of the house being angry, you catch that, being angry, said to the servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city. This time, you're not going to invite the shiny ones. This time, you're not going to invite the rich ones or the affluent ones. But I want you to go to the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. This time, go to everybody. So they went out a second time. Now, the second time wasn't like the first. They didn't just go to the high-end shopping areas. They didn't just go to the people that drive Bugattis. They went to the bad areas. Man, the bad areas where you find the hungry people. So they succeeded somewhat. And this is what the Bible says. They said, the servant said, Lord, it's done as you've commanded. And it worked. And yet there's room. There's room. There's still a little bit of room. Now, you really think. They not went out once, they went out twice. You really think God now at this point should pat them on the back and say, you've done enough. Pastor, you've done outreach before. Man, you've done years of this. You've done enough. You you could say that. Man, I've been out. I've tried this before. We've done this. We've done that. I've done enough. I've done my part. Somebody say, I sing in the music. I've done my part. Somebody say, man, I help teach or babysit the kids or whatever, Sunday school, whatever. I do small group. I've done my part. But look at what it says. The Lord... They said, Lord, it's done as you've commanded, yet there's room. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out. This is what pastor said. Go out into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in that my house 
may be filled. I want to just give you that last picture of what God wants for this church. God wants us to stop when the house is filled. And when we don't have every last person in this city baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, church, we are going to work more. We are going to go further. We are going to do the next outreach. I am going to have somebody under my wing. I'll put them in my house if I need to. I'll buy them dominoes if I need to. I'll take them to Starbucks if I need to. Until this place is overflowing, there is yet room for revival. There is yet more that we could do. Come on, I'm telling you, God wants more revival, more souls, more baptized more filled with the Holy Ghost until the house is filled yes we we can do more we can do more and man I have a vision for this place to be full don't you man I love this church this is a beautiful church man the state of Washington any pastor in the state of Washington would kill like literally commit murder to have this church but I don't want it with just us in it. I want it full. I want it so full that this guy's pulling his hair out trying to buy more chairs that he has to blow a hole through that wall and sit him in the lobby. I want to create Sister Pastor a problem where we got so many kids packed in those Sunday school rooms up there she doesn't know what to do. Come on somebody. I want to see us go from one service to two to three to a Spanish daughter work. Come on, I got a vision for revival. Don't say you can't reach the Catholics. I was one. Don't say you can't reach the mega church people. We've won them. Don't say you can't reach the heroin addict. We've won them. Don't say you can't reach the government official. We've won them. Come on, somebody. Every language, every tribe, every tongue. We can do this thing. We got a plant. We got a water. And God will bring the increase. Amen. I'm done here tonight. But I wonder if you would just lift your hands and pray two ways. One, I want you to pray that God will use you. Could you pray that way? I'm going to pray that too. Amen. You'll hear me pray. You can put it in your own words. You can repeat what I'm saying, whatever you're comfortable with. But let's pray that way first. God, I ask you today to use me. I ask you to use me. I give you all of who I am all of what I possess my time, my energy, my finances, my intellect, my passions, my dreams, my family, my car, my house God I want to do a work for you and I can't take anything with me save the souls that I reach I pray that God you would use me right now I pray that you would give me eyes that see the harvest like you do I pray that you would give me conviction and passion and burden. I pray that everywhere I go, I would see the lost and dying world around me. I pray that God, you would use me in restaurants and in gas stations and grocery stores. God, use me in my workplace, in my school, and everywhere that I go. Let there be revival. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. You are my greatest hope. My greatest aim, my greatest ambition. God, it's not enough that I'm saved, but I want to bring somebody with me. It's not enough that I make it there. I want to make it with my sheaves rejoicing. Lord, I pray that you would use me, God. God, this year, I want to pray with people and see them get the Holy Ghost. This year, I want to talk to somebody about baptism and see them go down in Jesus' name. This year, I want to reach people in my family that I never thought could be reached. This year, I want to reach friends that I never thought could be reached. God, use me, I pray. Lord, right now, across this room, I pray that you would give us your eyes to see the harvest as you see it. God, help us to see them as more than a nameless, faceless number in a crowd. But God, let me see the next youth pastor. God, let me see somebody that has a call on their life. Let me see 
somebody that can be a prayer warrior in the church. God, let me see somebody that can be worshiping beside me that today doesn't even know you. Everywhere I go, I pray that you would plague me with seeing them as you do. God, let me see what you're capable of. Let me believe and have faith for God, something bigger and something greater. I pray that, Lord, you would give me your faith and your heart and your burdens. Corporately for revival. Corporately for revival. Amen. As we're coming into this service and, and I'm just trying to listen to the Holy Ghost and just be in tune, I feel so many things all at the same time. I mean, to, to the point I almost half felt like scrapping this and just preaching all these spirits I feel like they're dealing with and mentalities and ideologies, ambitions and competing distractions. There's so many things in the city that are just swirling, barriers, obstacles, doubts and faith and I know I hear all these things but hear me friend, we serve a God, we serve a God that said that this church he is trying to start here, nothing can prevail against it. We serve a God that's that's simply greater, that owns more cattle on a thousand. We, we serve a God to which every knee and ideology, principality, power, it has to bow. And I wonder if together we could just bind together. We could agree together. We could declare some things about what God is going to do. And, and, and without knowing all the details, I, I believe that just right now, just us, at the power of His name, we have the power to just bind it all. See it all fall. See every distraction disappear. See every wall come down. Come on, let's pray that way right now. Right now, by the power of the name of Jesus, God, I believe that we have worked our way up to a certain level and we may may have hit a ceiling we may be on a plateau but right now we agree together by the power of your name from this moment on there will be an openness from this moment on there will be a breakthrough I believe and agree now that every devil of hell every principality every power will be subject unto us I pray that God you would cast it out of this building. I pray that God you would cast it out of this region. Let everywhere that our feet set foot take dominion. I pray that you would give us every street. I pray that you would give us every neighborhood. God give us schools. Give us businesses. Give us revival Lord. together. Come on somebody, we agree together. There's going to be a new level. We agree together. There's going to be a new openness. When we go out on outreach, it's not going to be like it was before, but the Spirit of the Lord will prepare the way. We will encounter hunger. We will encounter thirst for the Lord, and God will bring a great revival. We agree together that you're going to fill this house and some. We agree together that you're going to win the lowest of society through the highest of society. We ask you right now to dispatch your angels round about this city from the north to the south to the east and the west. We ask you right now to release visions and dreams. We ask you to move out on the hearts of men and of women and do what we never could. God, create hunger in them. God, break them and move on them convict them and speak to them right now by the power of the name of Jesus come on somebody by the power of the name of Jesus let it be done let it be done Amen. I wonder right now if there's a name that's coming to your mind. Somebody, come on. Somebody you work with, somebody in your family. Could you just say their name? Come on, say it before the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Come on, in the name of Jesus and give them the name. Give them the name. You're going to reach them. You're going to break their mentalities, philosophies, their hardened of heart. And in the name of Jesus, I will see them in this place. And I'll see them filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Come on, say their name.
Can we all come to the front right now in Jesus' name? Let's come to the front. We're going to pray. We're going to believe. You know, many times faith is spelled W-O-R-K. And the Bible does say you cannot serve God and mammon. At some point, you're going to have to choose what portion of your resources, your time, your talent, your energy that you're going to pour into the kingdom of God or to your work. We have felt the burden, the prayer for Brother Anderson. It's authentic. Did you feel that? It's authentic. And some of you are retired. Some of you have flexibility in your schedule. And at some point, we've got to ask ourselves, what do we do with those hours? I want you to make a commitment to the Lord. I know we've done this before. and Some of you are still doing it. But if you haven't gotten one of this yet, can you just lift up your hands? And we'll put one on your, on your hand. You know, this is God's idea. And with the Lord, timing is everything. I wanted to do this for a long time. Didn't feel the release. We have taught 100, more than 100 Bible studies now. And our goal was this year, and we far exceeded that. And those of you that have taught it, you need to go back to them and remind them for this culmination of this Sunday that they would come. Get a commitment. Do everything you can. Bribe them if you have to. But just don't give up on them. But faith is spelled W-O-R-K. The good thing is you don't have to do this by yourself. First of all, you get the Holy Ghost. And Jesus did send a 20 by twos. Now, I know there's some that will do that by themselves, and I thank God for you. But would you pray right now that God would give you somebody here that you could partner with, perhaps you're comfortable with, or just God drawing you together, and that you make a commitment from now to the end of this year that you're going to get at least, we're going to order more of these you're going to have God lead you to your neighbor, to a friend, to a door that you're going to knock, or perhaps leave this and come back again. This is the sign to actually be picked up. If you could put that up, please. This is designed to be picked up because it asks them if they have any pain, body pain. God has healed people here, body pain. If they have back pain, God has healed people here of back, severe back pain. We've had three people that were healed of diabetes in this church. The latest one, Sister Marta, sitting over here. We've had people healed of heart problems, hole in their hearts. So this is not a fluff thing that we haven't seen happen in our midst. And so I just want you to make a commitment. If two is too much, maybe even just one a week. Just go to a door. The rest of the weeks. And if you can do it by yourself, thank God for you. If you're afraid or timid or whatever the reason may be, find somebody. Find somebody. Friday, Thursday. If you don't have anybody, call me. I'll go with you. I've gone to Brother Paul in his neighborhood. I introduced him to his neighbors. We'll do whatever we need to do. Amen. But there's got to be an urgency. There's got to be an urgency. Would you pray one more time that God would baptize you and I with an urgency, that the love of God would constrain us, 
Would you make a commitment right now in the presence of the Lord? Would you make a commitment to Him? Father, I'm not going to be too busy, Lord. Father, I realize one day I will answer to You. One day I'm going to stand before You, Lord, and You're going to ask me what I have done with a talent that You have given me. You're going to an- I'm going to have to answer of this treasure that's inside this earthen vessel. I'm not going to bury this treasure, Lord. Freely I have received. Freely I will give, oh God. I release now, God. Lord, the burden of the reapers, the planters, those that water upon your people that are here, that have taken time tonight on a Wednesday to come into this house, and even those that are listening, oh Lord. God, that we receive your command, your burden in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you shout right now in Jesus' name as you make that commitment to Him. As you make that commitment to Him in Jesus' name. Somebody shout, I can do this. Somebody shout, I'll do this in Jesus' name. And I mean that sincerely. My Thursdays and Fridays are flexible for a reason. And if that is flexible to you, I am available. Unless something comes up. There are times that something comes up. But I will drive to your place. And we'll do it together. You know what? The the thing I found out, the more you do this, the easier it becomes. It's just the initial little awkwardness, you know, knocking on the door. The worst thing they could say is go away, right? I think you can handle rejection. It's all right. Amen. Oh, but the joy, the joy, the joy when they respond, the joy when they get healed, the joy when they get filled with the Holy Ghost, they get baptized in Jesus' name, and there's joy in heaven over one that repents. I'll never forget the day when our neighbor came to our connect group and when prayer was going on and she was just asked if there's any need and she surprised all of us. She said, I just want my soul saved. And God has healed her of several ailments. She went with Sister Chica in our neighborhood to hand this out. They prayed for the neighbor that we thought was Chinese actually turned out to be Filipino. Amen. They prayed for her. I believe she'll be here Sunday. Praise God. You know, you'll never know what God will do. If you've known me when I was younger, I will be the least likely candidate to actually come to church, much less pastor a church. But God could do anything. I believe you love people. I believe you want to see revival. You know, everything that we acquire in this earth, all the accomplishments, it dies here. It stays here. It dies here. Only the things that have eternal value goes into the other side. It goes into eternity. Your prayers, your tears, what you've sown. Pray for my sister. I believe she's going to come. Your name is Ging. And I pitched. I said, hey, you, you want to meet another doctor? And that actually left his practice to be an evangelist. He goes, what? Who would, who would do that? Well, he, you, know, you got to come. I'm praying. I'm praying. You know what God told me? As, as Brother Bray, can I call you Brother Bray? I just, just feel a kindred spirit with him. If we would just find somebody and stick with them for the end of this year and not give up on them. Whoever God brings, just just stick to them. I know you've heard this, like white on rice. Stick with them. They may say, hey, I don't want to, right? Because most of us didn't come or didn't respond right away. I know Brother Jim you know, ignored me for six months. I, I keep reminding him that because <laughs> I didn't like it. <laughs> but here he is. Praise yes. God. Hallelujah. So 
So you just stick with them. And stick with them. And stick with them. And stick with them. Uh, it, it might even say, you know what? Don't, don't bother me, you know? And if God quickens you to text, call, email, just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Because it's not really up to us. God gives the increase. He just tells us to plant and to water. And look, you're the increase. God's done miracles. We paid off this building. Praise God. Amen. Sister Marta, we love you. Don't ever forget that we love you. The, the adversary may want to attack you and say, you know what? No, we love you. Amen. Amen. We love all of you. So tomorrow, we'll have some outreach here. Then we're going to help Quinn Park Church. And let's just do a work for the Lord. Amen. Brother David, would you come? Would you close us in prayer? In Jesus' name. Adopted Buena Park Church or adopted daughter work. In the name of Jesus, can we all just lift up our hands? In the name of Jesus, Father, we love you. We thank you for what you've imparted into us, God. Lord, I pray that you would compel us in the spirit, oh Lord. Let us not be content in where we are at. Let us not be content when we don't push back the kingdom of darkness. Let us not be content, Father, with no seed being planted each and every day, Father. Compel us in the spirit, oh Lord. Let it be imparted to us, oh Lord. I speak a boldness over your people, oh Lord. I cast out every form of fear, oh Lord, of intimidation in the name of Jesus. And let your love be spoken when every word is spoken to every seed, to every ground, Father, that everyone would get a chance to know you in the name of Jesus. I pray your grace upon your people. Let your peace be upon your people, Father. In Jesus' name, let there be a set direction, oh Lord, each and every day we walk out each and every person we meet Father for your glory for your kingdom in the name of Jesus we pray would you rejoice ahead of time right now come on would you thank him of this as if it has already happened because God is eternal he's already there can you picture it through the eye of faith in the name of Jesus Christ in the name Jesus Christ. Amen. Come see. Let Brother Paul know if you're able to join us in the morning and then in the afternoon we have connect group on Friday and then Friday at the Irvine Spectrum as well. God bless you. We'll see you on the outreach and we'll see you Sunday in Jesus' name.